Hey, Pasadena Covenant Church. Even though we're not gathering together in the same space and in a normal way, no matter where we are, we join together with sisters and brothers all around the world to seek God and to engage in God's mission of grace and love. In light of the current health crisis, Pasadena Covenant will be using this digital format to continue our journey through Lent and through the Book of Jonah. To the side of this video, you should find a playlist with recommended songs that we think go well with this worship experience. You'll also find these videos linked in the description below. In this video, you will have the opportunity to hear from Pastor Steve in his message on Jonah chapter 2. You'll have an opportunity to pray as well as an opportunity to give. This is a work in progress. We as a church, like so many around the world, are entering new territory, exploring what it means to be a community while we still protect those who are most vulnerable among us. Let's lean in together and find that wherever we are, as we seek God, God's peace is with us. Before we move into a time of prayer, we encourage you to pause the video and check out some of the videos that are on the playlist or linked in the description below. If you're comfortable with it, sing along. If you have your kids with you, sing along with your kids. When you're ready to return, we'll have a time of prayer. Let's take a moment to pray together. Today, we're gonna to pray around two topics. One, for our world, as we all deal with the COVID-19 outbreak. And two, let's also pray for the most vulnerable in our community, those who are more advanced in age and those who have underlying health issues. Let's pray together. God, we lift up these prayers to you. Would you bring wisdom to our leaders, health to those who are the most vulnerable, and peace to us all. In Christ's name we pray, amen. These are new times for us, and we're experimenting with new ways of connecting with you. Thank you for sticking with I just wanted to say good morning to you as you are probably either um, in your house um, or uh, at work, uh, what have you, and you're listening to this or you're watching this. And, um, and this is uh, our very first video from um, the office to you all in the time of um, the coronavirus and the social distancing that we're practicing while trying to continue to keep communally intimate as we worship together um, through to the, the, the wonders of technology um, because we need to learn how to continue to walk together to whatever climate uh, we find ourselves in. And so that's who we are as a church, as Pasco family. And, uh, and I want to encourage you to continue to reach out to others, others that know that, uh, that you know may be um, lonely or isolated during this time. Continue to be a friend and a neighbor. Love others as you love yourselves. And so here's the message that I want to bring to you this morning. In light of all the craziness that's going on right now, um, it's hitting the airwaves. Uh, it's impacting us in a very real way. For those of you that have families, uh, children like I do, um, we're scrambling to figure out how to, how to make life work um, with, with both uh, Emily June and I uh, working. We're trying to figure out, well, how does child care happen? Uh, for those of you that are single parents, um, my heart and prayer goes out to you as you are trying to figure out all of these things um, yourself and figuring out how to continue to provide for your family. Um, for those of you that are, are, are uh, at home or, uh, you know, uh, have trouble getting out and hoping that Sunday morning was that one morning that you can come and meet with other people. I'm so sorry that this has impacted you in such a real and, um, and, and painful way. Um, and we're going to try our best to try and reach out to you as well um, and to make sure that you know that we see you, we know you, we love you, we think of you often as we really do. 
as we hold you in our prayers in our hearts. But at the same time, we also want to be cognizant of the dangers of what this, uh, this virus is and how contagious it is. And so we want to be careful in what we're doing. And in this time, we have to remember that we are part of a community of faith that knows that God is the Lord of the seas and the earth. He created the heavens and the earth and everything in it. And that he is the one that's with us. So to begin our time together, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we are here together. Powers of, um, of technology that allow us to at least hear one way um, what you might be saying to us. And so we give you this time. Come meet us in your name we pray. Amen. You know, it's very interesting to be studying Jonah 2 um, in the midst of all these things that are going on, right? Uh, there's all this tumultuous um, panic that's going on in the airwaves and in our news feed. And uh, and in the same um, time, we're reading about Jonah being caught up in a boat um, and, as he's fleeing from or fleeing to things. And, and the only way that he, the sea could get calm is if he's thrown off the boat. So that's how we ended last week was that Pastor Dan talked about what are you fleeing from? What are you fleeing to? And sometimes we are so stuck on not wanting to obey God that we'd rather die than follow God. And so that's what happened to Jonah. He'd rather die. So he said, throw me off the boat and you'll be spared to the fishermen. And he was thrown off. And this is what happens um, at the end of chapter chapter 1. It says this, verse 17. It says, Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I want you to stay with that for a little bit. That uh, God could do anything, right? God could have um, had a, an eagle, a giant eagle fly and grab Jonah and put him on to dry land. God could have, um, you know, sent a boat. Um, he, God could have calmed everything just for that moment. God could have even allowed Jonah to float on top of the water and not be harmed. Uh, God could have even just like teleported Jonah out of the situation, but no, he didn't. As a matter of fact, um, he did something even more drastic. It says here that, that the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. The Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. That a huge fish would go grab Jonah and bring him down deeper into the water. Not exactly an idea of a Shangri-La. Not exactly an idea of, of a shelter, right? And yet you have to fix yourself and remind yourself that this word says the Lord provided. The Lord provided a fish. I, I wonder... Um, what was going on in that dialogue between Jonah and the Lord in that moment that Jonah had said, I'd rather die than obey you. And the Lord saying, I'd rather you live so you can change your mind. And of course, the poor fish is saying, you want me to do what? So, but that's that's the reality, right? That we are always trying to figure out how to make things less inconvenient for ourselves. And yet God says, no, actually I'm going to provide a deep inconvenience for your life so that you can learn to listen to me. There's this thing about being in the belly of a fish that keeps you from doing other things. It kind of locks you in to a time and a space where you have to work things out, where you have to you can't get away. There's not much real estate within this fish. Or metaphorically speaking, in your own life, or, or literally speaking, in your own life, right? There's, there's times that in your life where you might be caught up in a place where it just seems like you can't get away from it. And no matter how hard you try, and it's dark, and it's dank, and it smells like fish, and, it's, and you don't want to be in this place, it's hostile to you, right? It's, it's not comfortable to you, and you can't get out. And you, wanna, you think that this is death. 
You think that because you're in the belly of this, this painful thing, you're in the pits, that you think that this is, this is not where you're supposed to be when exactly this is what you're supposed to be. This is where you're supposed to be. We're so afraid of discomfort that we don't realize that sometimes God provided it because you need to work some things out. You know, um, in this in this story, the, the fish here is, um, there's a gender. You have to understand that there's a gender uses for fish. And the gender use for the fish in verse 17, um, chapter 1, is, is a male fish. And so when it talks about the belly of that fish, it's, um, it's the guts, it's the di- digestive system, it's acidic, it's trying to consume you alive, it feels like you're about to die. Have you ever felt like that? What are some deep things that you um, have put off perhaps because it just felt like you would die, you'd be consumed by it? Things that you just said, you know what, I don't want to deal with that feeling or that thought or that accusation or that that anguish, I'm just going to put it off. I'm too busy. Um, I'm too, I, I, I'd rather do other things. Um, or I just, quite frankly, don't want to go there. And all of a sudden, you're stuck in a place where you have to deal with it. That God perhaps provided this fish, this time, this season, exactly so that you can work on that. I know a time for me when I was in college, when I uh, was dealing with um, my own disillusionment. And I was really, um, I I found, I met my first uh, season of disillusionment when a guy overheard, and this is a guy, um, Rob, who was um, absolutely smart um, and and brilliant, articulate, kind, and and all of that stuff. And... um, And I really respected him and his ethic. Um, And when uh, when he found out that I was going to Bible study one day, he goes, he looks at me and he quizzically and he says, wait, you really believe in that stuff? And, And that shocked me. He goes on to say, yeah, Jesus is like Paul Bunyan and the Holy Spirit is like the, the blue ox. The Bible is just a, a, um, a bunch of fables, a rule, a rule book. And that really shocked me. I never thought of it that way. I thought that I, you know, everybody, I grew up in church. And so I just assumed that everybody knew who Jesus was and thought he was the best thing. And that the Holy Spirit was the one that guides us. And the, the, this Bible was the word of life. And I never met anybody that thought otherwise. And, and so it shocked me. How could somebody that um, is so upright and respect, uh, respectable and, and, um, and kind and, and has such strong ethic not believe that this is good and that Jesus is real? And it turned me for a loop. And it made me look at life in a different way and wondering, is Jesus real? Have I been living a farce? And I didn't want to deal with it. I wanted to get on with life. This was too uncomfortable. I'll go to Bible study. I'll do my stuff. And then on the other side, I'll just kind of live life and and, and not tell anybody about my faith because I'm not so sure whether or not it's real, but I don't want to deal with whether or not it's real because it's too uncomfortable because my entire structure of life was built around a life of faith and and to tear that down would be utterly painful because what would be left? So I just let it go. I ran away from that. What are you running away from? What are some deep things that you have put off because you just didn't want to deal with it? What disappointments, what fears, what accusations, what disillusionment do you want that you do not want to deal with that now you're in the belly and it's coming up for you? The thing, however, that we find is that the story's not over. That Jonah wasn't consumed, right? That we find that something changes for Jonah and we realize that there is more to Jonah than we we thought. You see, the story goes from verse 17 of chapter 1 to verse Uh, one of chapter two and it says um, again it says here inside the fish 
Jonah prayed to the Lord. I can say that's really nice. Oh, that's, of course, we pray in times of distress, but you have to understand something that, you remember I talked about the gender of the fish? Well, when, when Jonah was initially swallowed, it was swallowed by a male fish, right? But in the story here, the writer actually transforms the gender of the fish from, swall- from male to female. It's in, verse, in verse 1, it says, from inside the fish, from the belly of the fish, this fish right now is a female one. And, and when, we, when, when, uh, when we use a female fish, the word inside the belly is no longer the guts. It's actually the womb. What was once a place of destruction, of consumption, of, of swallowing up and, 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 spitting, and spitting out at the, and, and completely decimating has now become a place of birth, of growing. And it is in that space that God met, that Jonah met the Lord. You see, the thing about it, sisters and brothers, is that in the belly of our disappointment and our disillusionment, it's the, it's the prayer that transforms the environment that we're in. It's the prayer that transforms the environment that we're in, that moves it from death to life, from dying to being born. And this is why. It is not because Jonah was able to utter some magic words But as my friend would say, it's not just getting the magic words right. It's actually about finding yourself in the magic heart place. That you are actually in a place where you are ready to meet God. Because prayer, in a nutshell, is dependence on God. Prayer is dependence on God. We find here that Jonah is praying this huge prayer. And let let me read this prayer to you, but you have to understand that this is a very interesting prayer. And I'll I'll share more a little bit more about that in a minute. He says, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the deep of the realm and for from deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me, all your waves and breakers swept over me. I said I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed was wrapped around my head. The roots of the mountain, I, to the roots of the mountain I sank down, the earth barred uh, beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. My prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away uh, and turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. This prayer, as scholars have found out, is a patchwork of psalms. In many ways, this is the Israel's greatest hits. And, and, this some 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 um scholars would say that this is just Jonah trying to grasp the greatest hits and saying if i just patch this together somehow god this will be the magical words that god will then finally um uh, relent and and you know be pleased appeased by by all these wonderful words but on the other hand actually um i would say something different I have a little bit more empathy for Jonah that he's not just a a, a guy trying to get out of the fish, but he is one trying to grasp for reality. I don't know about you, but my prayers are a little bit messy. I don't have this this complete beautiful picture of of how everything is peachy keen and I'll always trust you. No, my prayers are a patchwork of things of the greatest hits in my loom life. And I try to figure out, God, will you, will you trust, uh, will you, will you be faithful to me again? Where are you? And as a matter of fact, Jonah's prayers are very self-centered. 26 times he says, I, 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 me, 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 me. That's kind of us, isn't it? We're selfish, self-centered, piteous people. At the same time, 
Jonah doesn't shy from it. He says, God, I'm crying. It feels like, and, I, 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 and I'm seeing this in the beginning, you threw me into the waters. Your breakers rush over me. I feel like the seaweed is wrapping around my neck and I'm dying and you're doing this to me. The blame is on you, God. When actually it wasn't, right? He asked to be thrown into the waters. But sometimes we have to work those things out so that we can get to the point where we said, where we say, when my life was ebbing away, this is verse seven, I remembered you, Lord. And my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. That's very important for us to realize. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you. You see, we are people that sometimes are just grasping for reality. And sometimes we're just, our prayers is, God, there's something about you that I don't quite understand. I feel this way, but God, will you show me your reality? I don't get you, God. And yet I will learn to depend on you. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I will shout, Shouts of grateful praise will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. There is a reorientation, a clarification in Jonah's life that says, I don't get you, but I will say I will cling to you. And I will say the salvation comes from you and you alone. And in the end, verse 10, it says, the Lord commanded the fish. And again, this fish is turns back to male. And it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Why is it important that it's male? It's because the environment that was hostile to Jonah has now found Jonah hostile to it. That Jonah has at this, this time found the dependence on the Lord. And in this time, it has become hostile to the fish to the point that it had to spit that thing out. We have become holy spit up, messy people that have been sanctified by God, not because of what we've done, but because we put our dependence on God through prayer. When was the last time you prayed a messy prayer? Well, you just let it all out with God and you had it out with him and you, you showed him the deepest, darkest fears and insecurities and doubts and skepticisms and cynicisms you have that you've been afraid to share because you thought if God knew that you would not, that God would have nothing to do with you, even though you back in, in your mind, you knew God knew everything about you. But yet, if you brought it up, perhaps that made you not a Christian anymore. But instead, God said, that's exactly what I want to hear because I want to get to the bottom of those things so you can finally let go of it so that you can hold on to me and get spit out of the place that was hostile to you. Sisters and brothers, this is real things. When I, back to the story in Richardson Springs, I was at a place where I was deeply, deeply in anguish. And I remember at one point in time, I, um, uh, I just had it with God. I didn't want to deal with God at all. And as a matter of fact, um, I, was, I found myself at a retreat. Um, for some of you, you might know it if you're familiar with uh, YWAM, Youth with the Mission. They have a retreat um, center in, um, in Richardson Springs in Ch near Chico. And, um, and we were there for our fall, our spring conference. And, and I was just, I just kind of had it with God. And, um, and, but I was there because I was dutiful and I was running away from my feelings of anguish and I didn't want to deal with my, my disillusionment, but we started singing these worship songs and I couldn't, I, I just was looking around saying, do these people really believe this? I'm throwing my oxygen into the air and I don't know if there's anybody there to hear it. And so disgusted with myself, I could not do it. Uh, I guess I had too much integrity. My integrity caught up with me. And so I, 
I turned around and I walked out of the room and I, and I turned, I walked out of the lobby and I, I walked um, out into the foyer, kind of tucked into the night. And I looked at God, or the sky, and I saw a full moon and I said, God, show yourself to me. This was the belly of my disillusionment. I finally had it and I needed to come and figure out, figure this out right now. And I said, God, show yourself to me. Do something to prove to me that you're real. God, can you hear me? Nothing. And I started to panic. The, the fear, the, the fear that everything that I believed and understood was starting to shake and quiver and begin to unravel and, and fall apart. And I said, God, do something. Make a, make a coyote howl. We were in the wild. Make, make an owl fly across the full moon. Do something. And it was absolutely quiet. And I shouted and I screamed and I yelled, do something, say something. This is it. After this, I'm moving on with or without you. And I cried. And I fell asleep. Because I did not want to leave that place. But I didn't know what to do. And God did not provide for me what I wanted. When I woke up, it must have just been a few minutes, but I woke up and nothing had changed except that my Bible study leader was sitting next to me patiently. Now you have to understand that I hid myself in the corner of the foyer. Nobody would have been able to find me. And later I found out that uh, God had at that moment for my Bible study leader, who was actually going through the same thing and feeling quite honestly, quite um, torn up about his own faith himself, felt God tap his shoulder and say, where's Steve? And um, Mike Farrell got up, turned around, walked straight out the room, straight out the lobby, turned to the left and saw me. And so God brought the two of us together because he knew that God knew that I didn't need thin realities like an owl flying across the moon or a coyote howling to, to be the one um, to, to show me my faith. No, he needed that I needed a human being to represent the body of Christ to me. So that I can say that the Lord is my salvation. And it's from there that I emerged snotty and messy, like holy spit up, walking back into the room, ready to talk to God again, because he finally helped me realize that he's always been there with the people that have been with me since the beginning. Sisters and brothers, we are in the belly of our disappointments, our disillusionments, our doubts, so I have some reflection questions for you I want to ask you. And perhaps you can pause this video to think about it before you move on after each question. So the first question I have is, what disappointments or disillusionments, doubts, have you been avoiding that perhaps now is starting to rise up in you because of this, this time we've been together or be because of the, the fears of, uh, from the coronavirus? have been rising up for you. What are those things? You can pause now. The next question is, uh, who around you is currently in the belly of the fish? Who around you needs to be, needs prayer, needs presence, needs the body of Christ to be around them? And lastly, what prayers do you need to pray for others and for yourself? My encouragement to you is that you might want to just start with Psalms. Psalm 18 is a passage, if you are in, in the deep, dark places, 
Psalm 18 is a good one to begin with. So is Psalm 139, of a God that hears you and knows you. But you have to understand, sisters and brothers, that we are not done yet. As you know, we are chapter 2, and there's four chapters in Jonah. We know, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the story, um, the story shows a little bit of Jonah that, quite honestly, frankly, Jonah, Jonah's not done yet with his own discipleship, with his own transformation. He is holy and sanctified, but yet he's still spit up. He's still got some mess going on. And, and it's good for me to hear because I'm not done yet. God's not done done with me and God's not done with you. You know, it, it, in, in the, the Last Supper, Jesus washes his disciples' feet and he talks to them knowing that they were going to betray him and abandon him. And yet he does these things and he tells them, you did not choose me. I chose you. And so the midst of you feeling like you don't have it all together and you're not good Christian enough, you're not a not good enough Christian, God's saying, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And I'm going to provide the belly of the fish for you so you can work things out so that you can learn to depend on me. I'm not afraid of your doubts. I'm not afraid of your disappointments. I'm not afraid of your disillusionments. I'm sending you the fish so that you can learn to pray and depend on me. Because prayer, as we hold on to God, turns our hostile environments into the womb of rebirth. And so we choose for God together. Choose for God, depend on him, and he will bear you fruit in your life, and you will be born again anew. And sisters and brothers, this message is not for you, just for you, but for others as well. For the others that are, are espousing fears and disillusionments, join, join with them and walk with them and tell them about your story, about how you were in the belly of a fish and how God worked with you and spit you and, and, and spit you out of that belly. Take the reflection, Lenten reflections, the visio um, divina, the, the, the things that we have attached to this video and, and share that with others. Share it with your family. Read it every day and listen. Go on a retreat with us together for this Lenten journey so that we can share God with others as we seek him, so that ultimately we can celebrate the goodness of God. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we know that you are good and you're faithful, but sometimes we just don't get how all of those fit in our lives and how we expect them to be. We know, God, that in the midst of all these fears, that some of the things that we might be um, afraid of um, might seem small in light of people dying. But God, we, um, we know that you are at work there as much as you are at work here. And so we want to spend this time right now present with you, knowing that, um, that we need to be freed to free others. And so God, will you work in our doubts and our disillusionments? Will you, will you help us to embrace the belly and pray to you so that it becomes the womb, the womb of rebirth? We trust you, God. We're learning to trust you with what we know and what we have. So God, lead us and show us as we grasp for you. We grasp for you as you hold on to us. We thank you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Sisters and brothers, we are in a new season. There are things going on that's completely surreal. But trust me, God is holding us all together. Let us be people that are not isolated and afraid, but rather we are people of the body. Let us reach out to one another. Make a little phone call to somebody that, that God has us put into your mind or, make, or send a little text out. Just saying, hey, just thinking about you. Let's be people of constant community, an intentional community with one another in a time of isolation and fear. May we be people that are generous and loving. We love you here and we miss you. and We miss seeing you today um, and we pray all the best for you. 
All right. God bless you. Now as we close, may the God of peace be with you. May God give you health and strength. And may you know the depths of the grace that God gives us. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thank you for joining us today in this new format. If you have any prayer requests, email pastcov1 at pastcov.org. Those prayer requests will be shared with pastoral staff. And now, may the God of peace be with you. And may you go forth to love and serve the Lord.